Hello and welcome to our presentation of the Symbolics S products. I'm your host, Matt Elson, and today we're going to look at what comprises the graphics software in the Symbolics environment. There are basically four key products. There's geometry for defining the spatial relationships and building objects. Dynamics structures time. Render takes and looks at the three-dimensional scene and gives us a rendering of that. Paint is a fully developed and integrated paint system into the environment. And there's S-Record, which allows us to control the video environment. The relationships stand like this. Geometry and dynamics can talk to each other. Geometry can talk to render. Geometry and dynamics together can talk to render. Render and paint can talk to each other. Geometry and paint can talk to each other. Dynamics and paint can talk to each other. Dynamics and record talk to each other. And paint and record talk to each other. The benefits of this are that we have a fully integrated environment where you're never locked out of one program in favor of another. And everything can communicate with anything else, giving you full access to all the products and therefore the most power to be gained from them. Let's start in geometry. This is our geometry configuration. And what we're seeing in this window here is the world space. This is our global center with 0, 0 here, the positive Z, positive Y, and positive X axes labeled. The positive Z X plane is marked with the triangle. The pi positive Y axis is attached. The negative axes are all marked with gaps, so we have a nice, clean visual reference into the world space. Across the top of this window, we have the object sensitivities. Across the bottom, we have camera sensitivities. Down the side of the, this configuration are our menus, and the fifth menu is brought up with a mouse click. Uh, we use this menu so often that it doesn't make any sense to be placing it off to the side, so we place it where you can bring it up with the greatest ease. Across the bottom is a Lisp listening window, and uh, this is where one can talk to the computer or the computer can talk to you. And uh, below that, in this black line, you'll notice it updating as I go. This is the mouse status line. This is online documentation to let you know what your choices are at all times. You never have to leave the, any configuration to see what your choices are for the mouse. The mouse is very important. We have a three-button mouse, left, middle, and right buttons. It becomes a small keyboard when you're working with it. It's very powerful this way. Here we've created a simple cube. A couple of things to notice before we get too deeply involved with this. If we turn off our visible axes, we can see the cube and look at it from all sides in three space. I'm moving around the cube. The cube is not moving. I am moving. If we turn our visible axes on, we can see that we are moving around the cube. The cube is staying stable in relationship to the world. We do hidden surface removal by default. In other environments, what you would be seeing would be an object that looked like this. Very difficult to tell what's on the front and what's on the back of such an object. As the complexity factor raises in an object, it becomes more and more apparent that there's a need for doing hidden surface removal. We program in Lisp, and not only in Lisp, but we program in object-oriented Lisp. The particular advantages and powers to this way of programming, the first of which is that it's object-oriented. So when we're working, we can look at an object and we can ask it things about it. We can query it for various things that it can do. Here we selected the entire polyhedron, and we now would like to go and edit, we can see we have quite a long list of things we can do to edit this entire body. As we move down, we can also edit the faces, either singularly or collectively on the object. We can edit the segments or the edges of the object. And we can edit the point or points of an object. Here I'm moving it in X, Y, or Z space, controlling the, the three space environment from the two space plane with the mouse. Let's build a little object very quickly here. First we'll collect a series of edges. Those that we can see now we'll stop, move around the object, 
collect the last one. We'll cut these into thirds. Now we'll take and display all of the vertices on the object and we can see those vertices we've just created. We'll take the forward edge there and cut it into the middle. Now we'll select the top polygon and begin to cut that into three pieces. You'll notice that my mouse appears on top of the the last choice that I just made, which is cut. So as I work, I begin to accelerate because the system is configuring itself to my working methods on the fly. Now we'll pull the camera back. We're not moving the object during all these operations. We're moving the camera around the object. We'll extrude that polygon along its normal, which is a 90 degree angle to the face scale it down. Now we'll move it back in Z. Next we'll collect both of the other triangles that we created. Let's look at the object from the front, the side, and the top. Now that we're on the top we can watch those as we extrude them out then scale them down towards their common midpoint, then move them using their element normals as a direction. Now we'll move them back in Z, and it should become apparent that we're making a little airplane. In order to create the fuselage, let's take the forward polygon and we'll extrude it along its normal. Extrude it again. We'll scale that down to create the nose cone. And we'll put a little needle on the front by extruding that last polygon and then collapsing it to a point. To put some more delta in the wings, let's take the leading points on the wings, wing edges, and move those forward in Z. Now as we move around the object, you can see we've got a fairly good representation of a little boxy plane. So in order to make it more aerodynamically sound, let's smooth it off. And we'll come back to smoothing more later. So you can see how quick it is to build an object in this environment. Well, let's take a look at a couple of other ways to create objects. We have platonic solids, tetrahedrons, octahedrons, icosahedrons, and then geometric primitives, cube, cylinder, sphere. These can be made with default parameters or with the mouse. Anything that we do in our environment interactively, we can also do with the numeric input. Here we'll create a little house. first by encoding the outline. Now we can encode in the environment. We can encode external data from, from architect's drawings, three space drawings. We can also input and output data from CADM, CATIA, and IGES formats. Now that we've built half our little house, maybe we'd like a sloping eave on the end of it. So let's grab it, and then we'll rotate it by selecting an axis here on the bottom of the face. It's a very powerful aspect of the environment that you can reach in and 
and treat these objects in all sorts of different ways and manners. They're very, very malleable objects. Now here, if we'd like to move that chimney, we can again select a segment and just slide it around on the chimney until we get it where we like it. We'll just dissolve these segments away. And now we have our little house. Once we've built the object that we like, we can animate it by shifting over into our animation program. And what you're seeing here is geometry across the top of the screen and dynamics across the bottom. This is a very, very important and powerful feature of the environment that you can have both programs running simultaneously, that you're never locked out of one, you're never closed out of one program in favor of another program. So if we take a look down here, there's a few very important features on this screen that we should take a look at. We've got time running from the left to the right, and transformations being calculated from the top to the bottom. You can treat your numerical and temporal data graphically. There's a key factor to be able to treat these things graphically. Let's take a look at our first script, which is a little thing about a dome, and we're going to fly out the top of it. As we look at this, it's 10 seconds long, and we can see that as we open it, there's three branches on this tree. We have a dome, we have the doors, and we have the camera on the bottom. If we open the dome, there's nothing going on in it. There's no curve type in there because all we're doing is making it visible. When we open the doors, we have a left door and a right door. If we take that and zoom in on it, we open these up, we can see that there's three segments going across in time for both of them. Let's open them all. And we can see that there's a curve and then they hold. So let's play this back. OK, and we have the rumble as they go taking off here. We're flying out through the top. Boom. In the Symbolics environment, we record bitmap files of our script, and then we play those back. There's many advantages to working this way, the primary being the amount of analysis that the animator can have. You can always play it in real time. You can play it forward. You can play it backwards. You can play it backwards and forwards. You can vary the speed anywhere from 10 times its speed, positive or negative. If we take a look at it here, we're playing it 300% of its normal speed. The crowning achievement of this is the ability to scroll this with the mouse. I can now slide my hand to the left and slide my hand to the right and move backwards and forwards through the script and see exactly what's happening at any given point in time. Here, we've actually drawn in the curve for the rumble of the engines as we go out. And by redrawing this, we can change that from a stochastic rumble to a drunken wobble by just drawing it across the screen. If our drawing is not as, as clean as we would like, we just take and smooth it with a low-pass filter, and we can, we can smooth out any bumps that we don't like. Here we have a bird that flies forwards. This is an animation that exemplifies hierarchical structuring of objects. It has six pieces in the wing, each one structured into the last one. If we take a look at it on the color screen, we can see the individual pieces intersecting each other and interpenetrating each other. Part of the beauty of dynamics is that we can treat our temporal data graphically. So once I have defined this single script for the bird flying, and its two-second pace, we can then take and insert that into a larger script, in this case, this 28-second sequence here for the New York City fly-through. If we take a look at the bird section of this script, we can see that first the script was copied into these repeated segments and then merely stretched and squashed into position so that we get the bird flying faster as it flies down through the city. Beyond this form of animation is a form called displacements. 
we can work with what are essentially smart objects. You can teach them how to breathe, how to walk, how to talk. They're single skin objects, single surface objects that can be deformed or changed in any shape that you like. In this case, we're seeing a little guy walking. This is when he just learned how to walk. He learns how to walk right, left, right foot forward, left foot forward, how to sit down, how to cross his arms and legs and go to sleep. And of course, one person by themselves might go to sleep, but if you get a bunch of them, what do they do? They inevitably party. Starting a little lower on the taxonomic hierarchy, we have a snake. And if we look very carefully at this snake, we'll notice, particularly in the tail section here, the muscles are actually contracting through the body. OK, with this script of the Doberman Pinscher, as the dog runs, he's a single surface. He's a single skin on that object. The feet never hit the ground the same way twice. He's able to run continuously and look around. We can layer on these displacements as deep as we want to go. If you want 300 layers of displacements, that's fine. There's no software limitations. And here we go with little higher level things with the head talking. And we can see this head speaking. Very simple slab structures, large polygonal structures. We can animate on a very high level of abstraction here. We teach it how to speak with one phoneme or another, and then we build those into an accumulated script. We animate with the fewest number of polygons. We can then take and copy this simple object and smooth it, and then drive a smoothed object in this animation. As we go in and analyze exactly what's going on here, we see that there are basically four things happening in here. We have the mouth opening and closing. We have the mouth corners pulling back. We have a pout. And we have or a, a pursing of the lips, an oo sound. And we have the smile that comes up at the end. If we open all of these up, we can now play this back. And as we scroll it with the mouse on the top line, we have close, open, close, open, close, open. We can see as we go up this incline, it, it opens. Here we have the mouth corners pulling back. The next line down, we can see the oo sound coming on. And on the very bottom, we can see the smile. Moving over into paint, paint is read from the left to the right. It's a tree structure. And this is the trunk of the tree, and this is, these are the branches as we move up. The green column and the color mixing area are stable areas. These do not change as we move down through the various menus. We can begin at the top with brushes. We have airbrushes, blending brushes, cutout brushes, diffusion, round, and speckle brushes. Uh, we can make and save an unlimited number and kind of brushes. You can make a library of brushes for client A, client B, client C, and then call them back up at any particular time while keeping them uh, separate. So here we have a, a simple black line. We can save that. We can change the mode of the brush, which is what's in the brush and how it's applied to the surface from a single color to an image. It can paint an image up through underneath. It can paint patterns, tile it, pick up other things. Um, we can use blending brushes allow us to get oil-like effects. And here we can see we're blending over the surface of this canvas. Cutout brushes allow us to cut things out and paste them up at will with soft edges or without. Diffusion brushes allow us to diffuse sharp edges and to blur pixel values one into the next. These will allow out-of-focusing effects. It's a very good compositing tool. Round brushes uh, allow us to create round lines across the screen. And speckle brushes allow us to create a variety of effects that simulate chalk and uh, chalk on paper, various paper effects. In shapes, we can create circles, 
rectangles, polygons, ellipses, lines, both spline connected and separate, and text. Text in the symbolics environment is both two-dimensional and three-dimensional when you're working with it. You can work with it in paint, and it's completely two-dimensional, but you can use the same font in three dimensions, extrude it, and play with it, and move it around in three space. This first column here, after the shapes themselves, the first column applies to what's in the shape. The second column applies to how it's applied to the surface. So in this particular case, we've got a single color, and we're applying it as a, as a solid across the surface. And we can put a gradient inside of there and change the opacity. Four color gradients, palette gradients. We can recolor an image on the screen or a structure on the screen. We can filter areas, mosaic them, brush them, uh, call up images into and resize images into shapes. We can apply them with gradients and opacity gradients, palette gradients. We can speckle on things. It's a very, very wide range of things you can do with shapes. In the miscellaneous file, you can copy regions around on the screen, move them around on the canvas, reposition them, cut them out from one area and paste them up somewhere else. Cut them out from one area and resize them somewhere else. We can apply grids to the surface of the canvas. We have shadows, drop shadows for our objects, for our paint objects. We can shift regions on the screen. This is a particular benefit for creating seamless mappings, uh, texture, bump, opa and opacity maps. Particularly beneficial here that we can take an area and shift it around on the screen, paint out the seams, and then shift it back and make a map out of it. Inside of the paint system, there's a complete animation subset. This allows us to create everything from simple to very complex forms of two-dimensional animation and combine those with our three-dimensional animation system. The paint system is a 32-bit paint system, 24 bits for RGB and 8 bits for the alpha or stencil channel, depending upon how you'd like to use it. The stencil is uh, 256 levels of opacity. And this allows us to do all kinds of very subtle and sophisticated compositing. The stencil can be created any number of ways. The first of which is by painting it onto the surface of the image. Secondly, you can create a shape with various gradients that can, that can be applied to the surface of the object or the image. The third way would be to create a stencil based on either a chroma key or an intensity key. And the intensity keys can be based on the red, the green, or the blue channels. For an intensity key based upon the red channel, we'll notice that where it's white, it's 100% stencil. We can set it there, and then we can adjust the softness of the edge of that stencil. The red is showing us where there's no stencil. The white is where there's 100%. If we were to base it on blue, we'd get a very different image. Here, we're, we'd be stenciling out the background. Here we can base something on a chroma key. So if we'd like to be sure that we're getting just her skin, we'll take an averaged color of the skin type, place it on our current color bar line, and now we can adjust the hardness of that red. There we're getting pretty much all the flesh tone. We can adjust the softness of that, and then read that into our stencil. In this case, we're dropping a red to yellow gradient over her. And then by reversing the stencil and flipping these colors over and redoing it, you can very quickly create posterizing effects. All sorts of very interesting graphic effects can be achieved very quickly with this. We'll be covering render now. Render allows us to take the three-dimensional information, the, the, the geometry information, the, the objects, and to give them surface characteristics and then get a picture back from what we've based, where, the, where we've placed the lights in the scene, what we've told the object to be, whether it's metal, wood, glass, uh, 
concrete, whatever. And then by placing all those parameters on the object and placing it in the scene, render will give us a picture back. And of course, sequential pictures are what give us animation. This is the render menu. And this is where we make choices that will determine what our object looks like. We can do things with smooth shading, and fong shading, and nice highlights, and texture maps, bump maps, reflection maps, opacity maps all of these sorts of things to give us a, a beautiful simulated reality. We're quite proud of the fact that you can have totally believable images in the symbolics environment that are 100% synthetics, painted inside the environment, built inside the environment, and rendered inside the environment with no external data coming in, except the hand and the eye of the artist. What we have here is an artist tool. Let's look at these dog images. This is an image of the dog in a very simple phase of its geometric construction. We take the simple dog and then we smooth it off and again to a higher level of complexity. The simple to the more complex dogs took approximately a minute each to create just by smoothing the dog off. We didn't have to go through and re-encode every new point. Here we have a very simple rendering form on this. Just certain gray shading, simple slab surfaces, here we've raised the level of polygonal complexity of the dog. And again, we raise it higher. These are still off with faceted shading. It's still just a gray clay object. The next thing we can do is take and smooth it off. We've now got nice smooth surfaces, but it's still gray and rather unappealing. So let's apply a reflection map to this. And here's our smooth dog made of gold. And this is the same image, the same dog but leaving the facet shading on instead of the smooth shading on. We can also take the same dog and paint it onto the screen with various forms. This is that combination of geometry and paint we spoke of before. For those of you who don't like fireworks dogs, we have the soft terry cloth model, the neon model, or the Halloween model. In conclusion, we've seen that the Symbolics environment is composed of four core products. They are geometry, dynamics, render, and paint. The combination of these four products allow you to create virtually anything that you can imagine. In conjunction with the S-Record software, you can output that vision to any video format worldwide, whether that's PAL, NTSC, or HDTV. Thanks very much for your time.